So hello, everyone. My name is Mark Hauck, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar from Access to Empowerment, Elevating Equity and Community Voice Beyond the Pandemic. Um, I'm the Grants and Impact Analyst for the Stony Foundation, and I am the Zoom technician for today's session. Before we begin, please know that we will be setting aside some time at the end of today's discussion for audience questions. If you have a question for any of the speakers, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window on a computer or at the top right of an iPad or phone screen and type your question into the box that appears at any time. Please be sure to include your name and organization with your question so that we can identify you for the speakers. Now, I'd like to introduce the moderator for today's event, Stony Foundation Fellow, Dr. Ruth Abaya. Ruth? Thank you, Mark. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. It's a real honor to have the opportunity to moderate this session. Um, thank you for joining us. So we're really excited. We have uh, over 200 people RSVP'd for this event uh, titled From Access to Empowerment, Elevating Equity and Community Voice Beyond the Pandemic. My name is Ruth Abaya. I'm a Stonely Fellow and an attending physician at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia in the Emergency Department. And my work is on gun violence prevention and using data to try to identify the most promising practices for violence prevention for the city. Um, I'm really delighted to be here to moderate this panel today, which is gonna take a look at how the pandemic has amplified longstanding inequities in our systems of care, while also requiring unprecedented innovation in determining how young people and families are accessing the services that they need. Um, the pandemic is, uh, in some ways, um, as, as devastating as it's been for so many communities, an opportunity to rethink how we can equitably rebuild and reimagine systems of care post-pandemic to better support specifically young people and to center their voices in the work that we do. Um, joining me in this discussion are Stonely's really fa uh, fantastic and outstanding Emerging Leader Fellows, and you're going to hear more about what each of them do in the next few minutes but I wanted to start by introducing them. So I'm gonna start with Dijanae Talley, who's an applied researcher, community organizer, and educator working with the Health Promotion Council. Cameron McConkie is a public health practitioner working with YHEP Health Center at Philadelphia Fight. Uh, Kaylee Hackett is a public health social worker with Policy Lab at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Carissa Phelps is an attorney and trained social worker with Temple Legal Aid. And Dr. Leah Brogan is a clinical psychologist working with Drexel's University's uh, Juvenile Justice Research and Reform Lab. So welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for being here. This is exciting. So we are looking forward to the um, experience and expertise that you are all going to bring from your respective areas of work to this conversation. And with that, we're gonna get started. So we wanted to jump in with a question about what the pandemic has meant for you in the areas where you work. Um, so just to kind of level set where we are for Philadelphia at this point, we have seen over 3,600 deaths, we've seen over 16,000 hospitalizations, but there's definitely a sense of a light at the end of the tunnel, right? We're at the point where we vaccinated over 700,000 people, and we're starting to see ourselves slowly emerge from this. And what we've seen is that the pandemic has really highlighted some longstanding challenges in our systems of care, but there are also these new opportunities. And so in what ways have you seen creativity and innovation used in response to the pandemic, both in your fields and in your areas of work. I'm gonna start with you, Dijanae. Thank you so much. Um, good morning again, my name is Dijanae Tally. pronouns her, she, her, hers, and the goal of my project is to um, uplift youth voice in gun violence prevention advocacy here in Philadelphia. Um, I'm sure many of you are aware, but um, Philadelphia is experiencing an uptick in firearm violence that hasn't been seen here in almost 30 years. Last year was not great, and this year is gearing up to also not be, it's, it's bleak. Um, and I came into this project, you know, thinking that I knew what it meant to bring young people into these conversations about gun violence. I sought to, you know, meet and connect with as many leaders in this work as I could. I sought to meet and connect with as many young people as I could find who, you know, were ready to get involved even in the midst of a pandemic. And um, I would have said that my intentions were the best, considering that I have a very real passion for this issue and also a very real passion for empowering young people. Uh, but the pandemic taught me that intention is not enough. Um, the how we do this work matters. And I think that, you know, at least for me in a very real way, COVID and the way that we were able to innovate to respond um, made me really pay attention to the how. And um, there's this book called Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And for those who haven't read it, I highly recommend it. But one of the greatest lessons I took from that book 
um, is doing things with people and not two or four people. Um, no matter how many times I have read it or will read it, I don't think any other moment in history would have taught me um, the lesson of doing things with people and just how dignifying that is. Um, I had a young lady who I was working with in the middle of the pandemic. And, you know, one day she asked me, she said, what is it? What does it mean? Like, when does what we say and what we experience and what we think become more important or matter just as much as the deliverables that I was essentially looking for? And, you know, now I believe that centering the voices of those impacted, sharing in that leadership, sharing in that ownership um, of program or service is at the core of this work and making sure that this work speaks to those needs. And so I think that's what it's about. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. And thank you again for having me here. Thank you, DeJanae. So Cameron, you have a public health background, you have been working in a health center. So I'm curious how you've experienced this during the pandemic. Yeah, so I'm definitely excited to get into that conversation here today. Hi, everyone. My name is Cameron McConkie. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm a Stonely Emerging Leader Fellow at the YHUP Health Center at Philadelphia Fight. For those of you that don't know, YHUP Health Center is a federally qualified community health center that provides young people ages 13 to 24 with primary comprehensive health care, including integrated behavioral health, HIV care and prevention, gender affirming care, and all regardless of insurance status, documentation, or ability to pay. At its core, my project is focused on expanding access to health care for vulnerable young people. And much like Dijonet, part of our project strategy at YHUP has involved developing structure for the authentic inclusion of young leaders and providers in our work. However, like so many nonprofits, and especially us as a health center, our world turned upside down last spring. Our daily operations and financial outlook crashed, and we spent months figuring out how to run a health system from home, diving into the world of telehealth and virtual community engagement for the first time in our existence. But we're here over a year later, more committed to the inclusion of youth voice than ever. And I'm grateful and humbled to be in conversation with you all today. And thanks to only Ruth, my fellow emerging leaders, my team at YHEP and all the young people I work with for inspiring me every day to show up and push for change. This network of mentors has reinforced in me that young people, their expertise, their experience and their leadership cannot be an afterthought or a value that exists only when funding is high and crises are low. My public health training, to your point, Ruth, has taught me the power of prevention, and I'm here to make a case that authentic youth inclusion and the development of trust and relationships and community are all tools of prevention. I hope my fellowship leaves YHEP and Philadelphia fight with the structures to center youth and involve youth in their care so that at the next crisis and throughout our service with young people, we can look to our young leaders and ask them, what can we do to help? So thank you. I'm excited for this today. Excellent. Thank you so much. So Kaylee, I wanted to turn to you and your work with Policy Lab. How have you seen the pandemic affect the ability to center uh, the voices of those you serve? Yeah, thank you, Ruth. Good morning, everyone. And like, I'm going to echo a lot of the points that Dijanae and Cameron have also made. But my name is Kaylee Hackett, and I'm an Emerging Leader Fellow at Policy Lab at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, as Ruth mentioned. And Policy Lab is a research center that strives to achieve optimal health by taking an evidence to action approach. And my particular fellowship project has really been focused on addressing and improving access to mental health care for parents and teens. In thinking and preparing for this panel, I kept coming back to how much has changed in the last year and my own journey to this point as well. Um, in approaching this fellowship, I was really inspired by my experience working with young moms as a home visitor and seeing the love, adoration, determination that they have to create the life that they want and deserve for themselves and their families while often facing insurmountable barriers at every turn. Really over the last year, we've learned that the behavioral health field can adapt, adjust, and lean into a virtual world. Telehealth services have reduced no-shows, increased access, and decreased many of the logistical barriers to receiving care. Uh, medical plan, plans and payers can and should and have continued to provide reimbursement for telehealth services. However, those improvements have not been received equitably those with more resources continue to have more access, whether it's a quiet, private, safe space to have a session or even internet access just to join. Um, and currently we're still in a really unprecedented surging behavioral health demand. And adolescent parents in particular are uniquely situated between both the adult or maternal mental health world and adolescent health. They're often overlooked and lumped into services that are not tailored to their specific needs. And we aren't going to be able to fix these vast problems without turning to the people who have the expertise, 
the lived experience and the knowledge to really make sure that our systems are not just adequate, but excellent. Um, their voices are vital to making lasting, sustainable change. And we, as people in positions of power, need to center that in the work that we do. Um, I'd like to thank you all again for having me talk today. I'm looking forward to deepening this conversation and really digging into how we can sustain and center equity in our work. Yeah, thank you so much, Kaylee. I'm struck by how all three of you that have spoken so far are really alluding to how privilege begets privilege and how disinvestment begets disinvestment. So that's definitely a theme that I'm already seeing emerging. Um, Carissa, your work is very different from everything we've talked about so far. Do you mind telling us a little bit about how the pandemic has affected your project? Yeah, so I'm Carissa Phelps. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, my project has been exploring pathways to kinship care. So what that means is I've been working with children's caregivers when the children are not being cared for by their parents. And I've been exploring both the pathways and the barriers that these, care, these kin face um, in either gaining or exercising legal rights that relate to their role as a caregiver for the child. So um, one, of the, one of the neat things about the pandemic is it has brought kind of a fun new way for me to describe to people who kin are. Um, so oftentimes when people hear kin or hear kinship, they think family or blood relatives, but the definition of kin in Pennsylvania is actually much broader than that. So if you think about who was in your pandemic bubble, um, they're most likely your kin. So for a lot of people that includes family, um, but it might also include others with whom you have a significant positive relationship, and that's who kin are. So, um, so if we think of that in light of families that I'll, you know, I'll talk about how that's so important to keep in mind later on. But um, I think what I've seen through the pandemic, similar to what Kaylee talked about in the medical field of systems um, adapting, um, I think since I've been working with kin in navigating the legal systems, specifically in uh, dependency and domestic relations, one of the highlights for me has been seeing um, the legal system's ability to revise policies and processes to create access to, to the court in a difficult time. So for example, the court started allowing uh, virtual participation in hearings um, when in-person hearings were inaccessible. And so we actually saw an increase in participation when barriers like transportation, child care, and taking off of work were no longer issues. Um, we also saw a reduction in barriers in the administrative process when the court allowed electronic filing um, and accepted electronic signatures. So I think the important, those are examples, but I think the important takeaway isn't necessarily that we have it right, um, how we're doing it right now using technology, um, although there are some good positives, um, but in, in making the court more accessible. But I think more importantly, um, what we can see from the pandemic is that we've seen this revision of administrative processes to create efficiency and access um, and, and that revision is possible um, and that we should uh, continue to do that. So I think this level of responsiveness to community need in creating access to the court is something that um, we've seen throughout the pandemic and uh, must be continued, should be ongoing um, to, to um, continue this as we move forward. Thank you, Carissa. And I, I have to point out another theme that I think is so important to highlight, which is what we can do and what we maybe thought we couldn't do before the pandemic, that the pandemic has taught us we actually have the capacity to do if we have the will to do it. So all of you are talking about systems changes, logistical changes, administrative changes that happened because they had to. Um, and so I hope that we don't stop reimagining creatively how we can make things easier for our families once we don't have the necessary barrier of the pandemic. So thank you for highlighting that. So Leah, uh, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about what the pandemic has, has meant for you as you've embarked on your work. Sure, good morning, everybody. My name is Leah Brogan. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm an Emerging Leader Fellow in the Juvenile Justice Research and Reform Lab over at Drexel under the direction of former Stonely Fellow, Dr. Naomi Goldstein. Um, and in my fellowship, I actually direct what's called the Graduated Response Technical Assistance Mentorship, or GRTAM for short, program. And I can talk about that a little bit later on today. Um, but I really want to dovetail off of what several of my colleagues, particularly Carissa, had just mentioned in her opening remarks about how the pandemic has accelerated change um, worth recognizing within large social serving systems, such as the juvenile justice system. And that sense of urgency at the beginning of the pandemic to restrict viral transmission and spread really led to monumental shifts in how the juvenile justice system operated. 
We saw the youth detention population drop dramatically by nearly a third between March of last year and March of this year. We saw probation departments turning to more creative, flexible approaches in supervising youth, such as virtual and even outdoor check-ins. Um, community service court conditions were converted into more in-home chores and responsibilities for some youth. Confinement was removed as an automatic response to technical violations. And even fines and fees associated with probation were relaxed to reduce economic burden on families during the pandemic. But unfortunately, um, many of these reforms were not equitably received across all juvenile probation departments and across all youth who are justice involved. We know that youth of color still remain disproportionately represented in the juvenile justice system. The rate of release for black and brown youth continues to lag behind that of white youth. And the dramatic drop um, in the number of youth in confinement, unfortunately, didn't lead to an absolute reduction of justice involved youth. Rather, it really shifted the load to probation. So nonetheless, the juvenile justice system, it showed that it can change, particularly when necessity calls for change. What I'm really excited to get into today um, and talk about is how now is really the time to strike while the iron's hot, per se, to ensure that many of the current outcomes of pandemic-based reforms actually become standard practice and open up doors for other reforms. So thanks for having me, and I'm really excited to get the conversation going. Thank you so much. Thank you all for those introductions. Um, you all do really inspiring work, so this is really um, a great place to start. I did want to talk a little bit about, so all of you um, work with populations who I imagine if we had spoken with the individuals that are your clients or the individuals that you work with, they would have been able to give us some of these insights a long time ago. And so one of the things that, that comes to the forefront is how do we put them at the table and how do we center their voices uh, in the beginning when we're starting to think about these things. And so um, all of you have made reference to that, to centering the voices of those who are most affected by these issues um, in systems and in services. And so I'm curious how you think we can elevate those voices of community members, of young people, of those who are justice involved, et cetera, um, in system transformation efforts. Um, and how would that actually change things in your various areas of work? And DJ, I'm gonna start with you. Thank you for that question. I think it's such an important one. Um, you know, you, we have to ask the tough questions of like how it, it sounds good, right? To, to center folks and to include impacted populations in this work, but the how is so much more difficult to kind of um, wrap our minds around. And I, I can say with confidence that every one of us on this panel, even everyone watching um, gets into equity work, um, this kind of work because we wanna help. Um, we wanna alleviate and eliminate suffering. We wanna promote equity. We wanna do all these wonderful things. But I think it's possible that sometimes we want those things so badly. Um, we wanna solve everyone's problems so quickly that we forget that the process matters. Um, we forget that that how matters. And you know, processes, especially in equity work, like I said, need to be dignifying and there isn't much dignity in being talked at. Um, and I'm saying talked at because my young people, we actually have a code word that we use when I'm taking up too much space. Um, they have a, a safe word, <laughs> um, being told what is best for you um, without being included in that conversation is not, dig is not dignifying and not being centered and not being valued as the most credible source of knowledge regarding a lived experience and what to do about it. And so I think when I think about how do we uplift those in those spaces who have that knowledge, who have that kind of like social capital to say like, you know, I know what to do, or at least we know what to do is first admitting that maybe we don't as, as service professionals, as people who are, you know, in this work that sometimes being a leader means taking a back seat um, and, and asking folks what they need, who they need, who's the best person to go to for this. Um, and, 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 you know, it's really important just to recognize that not doing that, it provokes disengagement. It damages buy-in and participation and it erodes trust. And those are, the, those are the building blocks of what it is that we do. So those are my thoughts on that. Um, yeah, yeah, it's hard, it's hard to say. It's hard to come to terms with. It's like, we really wanna help, but it's like, you, you, you can only take it as far and do so much. We're, it should be more of a partnership in that way. Yeah, and a follow-up question for you on that, Dijanae, because I think that's an excellent point. Um, I, in gun violence work in particular, which is of course a space in which I work as well, it's not uncommon for us to knock on the doors of those most affected after the fact, right? And so the question is, how do we, in our preventative approaches, our true public health oriented preventative approaches, bring them to the table sooner and maybe even incentivize 
their participation by showing them that we value their voices. And I wonder if you could comment on the timing of engagement. Yeah, gun violence is tricky because, you know, I have a, a, a colleague of mine in the city who says, you know, his critique of the gun violence landscape is, you know, we show up after the blood spills. And then, you know, what, what can be done, a lot of damage has already been done at that point that really we're just like literally putting a Band-Aid on it and anything that we do after the fact. And um, I can speak to what I believe, how I believe the Advocacy Institute functions in that way is, you know, it's a youth empowerment program. Um, they cover a number of issues now, including gun violence, which I was brought in to adapt their curriculum to gun violence. But I think um, there are other adjacent issues related to gun violence that I think we could start to address in the community and talk about in the community and really get like education programs going in the community before there, uh, an act of violence ever occurs. There, there is no real, um, let me not say that, let me say that um, there's a yearning for young people to understand the impacts of mental health and trauma on their day to day, right? And, that, and that's, that's the case before a shooting ever happens is, is to really be able to understand like how do instances of violence, whether gun violence or not, impact the child's adolescent development or their mental health or, you know, understanding how coping behaviors work. And that sometimes when a young person is engaging in certain types of behavior, that might be a response to something bigger than, than, than you know, what's happening right now. And I think that those are nuggets and those are little pieces of, of programming that we can put in place that don't depend on a shooting happening and maybe coming in after the fact um, as, as, a, as a reactionary measure, right? Sometimes we can really give communities the tools so that when things do happen, those things have already been in place, those, those kind of lessons that toolkit has already been in place so that they're already equipped to kind of do what needs to be done if and when something does happen. Um, and I think that that could go a really, really long way um, for folks. Absolutely. And Cameron, I wonder if you could tell us what you've learned in the last year about centering the voices of patients and the voices of clients and how we can do that earlier as we build systems of change. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, you said something earlier that that emphasized a point that I made in the beginning. I mean, I really do think of sort of in community inclusion and youth inclusion as a tool of prevention and that it really has to happen early on. And I appreciate, Dijanae, what you were saying about sort of the, the process in which this all works. And when I was reflecting on this, I was thinking a lot about, you know, why isn't this the norm? Why isn't, you know, early community inclusion and, and youth sort of voice, you know, a norm in the work that we do? Why isn't their structure to center youth voice embedded in systems inherently. And it's sort of got me thinking about some issues that are in place that I think, you know, prevent us from doing this work earlier on. There are issues of adultism and professionalism that create environments that are truly impossible for young people to access and to succeed in. I think there's a lack of understanding on behalf of systems for the developmental strengths and needs of young people in system transformation efforts. I think there are gross inequities and power imbalances across community members and systems, which impact trust, as Dijanae alluded to, as being you know, a really foundational you know, component of this work. And I think you know, there are also not always straightforward economic or outcomes arguments um, for the value of community inclusion and centered youth voices to systems. I think it's a really difficult thing to measure. And that poses a lot of challenges to change makers, myself included. I experienced this throughout you know, the work that I've been doing is how do I really sort of prove to the system that I work within that this work is important and impactful and drives, you know, the economic or health outcomes that people in the system care about. As I mentioned earlier, I think COVID has taught us a lot about prevention and emergency management, and it's exposed a lot of vulnerabilities that systems have in the work that we do. And I think as we continue this work, we have to understand that having structure to center community voice and, and center young people in systems and to have those truly authentic relationships and shared values with community is prevention because it impacts everything downstream. Those goals, they have a lot of obstacles. Our own system barriers are in the way, you know, such as the inequities and the biases that I just mentioned. But this is really nece necessary work in change making. So for me, that's what I really want to pose to systems and institutions that doing this work and doing it right is really impactful. It's a part of our strategy and the work that we're doing at YHEP right now so that we can be close to community and constantly adapting and responding to their needs. Carissa, it strikes me that your observation and, and your work that has identified that kin has a broad definition is something that a lot of Philadelphia residents probably, again, could have told us if we asked them, right? Um, 
And so how do we, in the work that you do, center the voices of those who are best qualified to identify who their kin are, who their support structures are, um, and how do we center their voices going forward? You know, Ruth, I think that's a good question because it should feel really obvious um, and, and shouldn't have to be said, but we should ask people. You know, I, I think so often, when, especially when you're dealing with legal systems, um, we have this idea that only um, legal relationships, legally recognized relationships um, have value. And um, so I think that what we need to do when we're working with young people, when we're working with families in any capacity, whether we're working with their parents, caregiver, um, or the kids themselves, um, is to ask, you know, who are the important people in your life? Where do you get support from? And I think kind of what, what we've all talked about is that I think we have to have this shift in perspective to um, communities and families and people being resources of strength and support for each other. Um, instead of, um, I think so often our, our people serving systems come in with this idea of we have the resources, we have the solutions, we're gonna bring them to you and your community and your family. Um, and I think we need to shift that perspective to, to acknowledging that families, communities, um, people have innate strengths in themselves. Um, so how can we capitalize on that? So how I see that um, specifically related to my work with kin, with kin um, and kinship caregivers is, um, I think, I think there's a, well, there's a number of things, um, but I think in the dependency world, in the world of child welfare, um, it's looking to strengthen and bolster those natural supports that families have. Um, so we're not coming in. I mean, if you think about it, it's not healthy for us to come in and say, hey, we're going to fix your problems. Um, we're going to put the child over here, put the parents over here, and then expect you to be able to come back together, leave you completely where we started, um, and expect you to be better off. I think we have to have this complete shift in perspective to saying, how can we look at the kinship circle, look at your natural supports around you in your community? Yes, that's family, and it's also other people. Um, and, and strengthen those and, and create resources and strength, not create resources, I'm sorry, strengthen the resources that are already there um, and, and, um, and have that be to, to bolster the natural supports to family and kids so they can do better. Um, I also think that um, kind of going to this kin is, isn't just um, family, isn't just blood relatives, um, is that we have a system that contemplates the nuclear family, mom, dad, kids. Um, and, and that's slowly expanding. So now dad, dad, kids, um, but still there's this idea of there are parents and children. Um, and in my work with kin, I think the opioid epidemic has heightened awareness around that of there are people who care for children that aren't their parents. And so um, how can we make resources available to them and recognize that relationship when there is this parental relationship um, that isn't the, the biological parent of the child. How can we, so again, with this theme of supporting what is already there and the strengths that are and supports that are already there um, to, to make systems and communities, uh, families, um, leave them off better than, than where we started. Yeah, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that we all probably look at maps regularly of the problems that we address and where the deficits are and how powerful it would be to look at what the assets are in those same locations and think about those communities from the standpoint of their assets and not just their deficits. Um, I do wanna ask you, uh, Kaylee, if you don't mind about how difficult, what the challenges are in centering the voices of, for example, adolescent parents who have so much on their plate um, and are navigating so many systems for not just themselves, but also for their children, and whether or not that that is a challenge. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for that question, Ruth. I think in approaching this work and through this fellowship, I've really kind of realized and have come to see parenting status as an equity issue. So I think in many ways, especially for young parents, their identity as a parent often leads to services or supports that are inequitable because they don't take into consideration their specific and unique needs, especially in many youth serving spaces. Um, so sometimes parenting status is an afterthought or they're really situated into two, maybe three different worlds where they're not the focus. Um, and I think as many of the other panelists and fellows have said that equity and voice go hand in hand. So they're intertwined in ways that really can't be understated and in meeting the needs of these young people and families, and that's 
really key to the work that we do. Um, and I think that equity is also about who has a seat at the table and whose decisions are being centered and heard. And I think in approaching my work, that was really crucial to me. I thought of it in a way of like, what do we know? What do we need to know? What have we learned? And really what can we do about it? Um, and really going directly to young parents and hearing from them that what is difficult to, to connect to mental health because there have a million different competing needs and that our systems aren't created to eliminate some of those barriers. Um, so there are logistical barriers. There needs to be more investment in systems and programs that really encourage trusting relationships because getting connected to mental health is hard. It's challenging, it's scary. And it takes someone there who you trust and can rely on and who has built up and invested time in you to help you get connected. And our systems aren't created to support that kind of work. Um, so from what I've learned in this work, um, we were really kind of like take all this information that we heard directly from parents and stakeholders to see what can we as a health system at CHOP do about it. Um, so we were able to launch a pilot to expand our existing integrated behavioral health care program to support and provide treatment to teen parents with maternal mental health conditions. Um, and this is more about meeting people where they are, where they're at, and just creating services that are going to eliminate barriers and um, just a really a, a new innovative way to reach populations that aren't getting connected to services. Um, and really finding, creating evidence and basis that integrating these systems into schools and medical settings really warrant more investment and study. And that it's our role as systems and change makers to make sure that we're meeting people where they are and eliminating all barriers to care that we can. Excellent. Uh, and Leah, this next question is for you and it kind of leads into our next topic of conversation. So um, a lot of the people that you and the systems you're working with are talking about people with the double whammy of being young, being justice involved, and then you've all made allusion to the fact that being um, in any way racialized complicates all of these systems even further. And so I wonder if you could comment a little bit on centering the voices of those who are disenfranchised in multiple ways, and then also how do we build systems and supports that actually meet these needs in a way that's equitable. So it's fabulous that there's been this progress in juvenile justice as we've realized we needed to adapt to the, to the pandemic, but how do we use the centering of voices to address the fact that those, those um, advances have not been seen equitably? Yeah, great question, Ruth. And you know, I think with the pandemic, if there was like one one primary thing the pandemic showed to the juvenile justice system, especially probation, was that it, it really had to rely on who was at home with youth on community supervision on probation. And so, um, you know, at the heart of building an equitable juvenile justice system, particularly a juvenile probation system, is family engagement. And I don't think that comes as a surprise to anyone. Um, but the double whammy here is that family engagement is the biggest barrier to a youth success while they're on probation. So how do we address that gap? You know, from the family side, we may have parents and caregivers who really struggle to fully understand how to support their kids when they're on probation and what that means. On the system's end, we may have policies, practices, or cultures that knowingly or unknowingly alienate um, or disregard the needs of families. So it's really how do we how do we effectively address this issue of family engagement um, and strive for those equitable systems of care, and I think an equitable probation system that really centers the family, which includes not just the youth but their caregivers as well as who's in the home with them, who is that supportive kinship, that bubble that um, you know Carissa was describing and articulated so well really requires a number of things. And first and foremost, there's a focus on your staff culture, right? So it's really keeping family at the center of the staff's awareness of the rehabilitation plan for the youth. Um, really asking ourselves, are we providing youth with treatment plans that are empowering not just the youth, but their family's voice and retaining connections with them? And that might have to be done through things like educating your staff or workforce on the diversity and family values and cultural norms of today um, to really make sure that we're not prescribing just one standard model of family engagement for any particular youth. Um, and this involves not just knowing about those diverse values and norms amongst family and family members, but also really collaborating with families, ensuring that they have an active voice in both decision-making and carrying out their youth's rehabilitation plan. 
Um, so, you know, a very specific example is, and something that some probation departments may have found themselves having to do during the pandemic, was really relying on parents and caregivers to administer incentives and positive feedback to youth when they were making progress on their court conditions or helping them to problem solve when they were struggling to accomplish their probation conditions. Um, I think also important, it's, it's important to recognize our definition of family, which many of my colleagues have already touched upon. And this is particularly relevant to justice involved youth. The definition of family for many justice involved youth is expansive. It has to recognize the involving nature of a family for a justice involved youth. Families extend beyond biological parents and caregivers and legal guardians. And it's really important that we identify who in the youth's life can serve as a consistent supportive caregiver and is at the table with the youth um, for probation hearings, with probation officers and throughout their time in the system. I think it's also really important that families receive guidance and training on how probation works and how to effectively communicate with justice system personnel, whether that's defense attorneys, judges, case managers, probation officers, as well as create and provide access to support services and resources that really address families' needs that if unaddressed can actually present huge challenges for kids successfully completing probation and staying out of the system. Um, and all of what I'm describing, this equitable system, it already exists elsewhere. Um, you know, Ruth, you as a provider may already be very familiar with this scenario, but for all of those in attendance today, think about taking your child to the hospital for an unexpected medical issue, and you're being informed about treatment options, outcomes, what to expect. The medical team is helping you navigate these options to come to an informed decision. And really, my question is, why should another system serving youth be any different? So great question. And, and again, I think these are things that are existing elsewhere in larger social serving systems. And I really do hope that they become part of the norm in the probation system moving forward. Thank you so much for that, Leah. Uh, I did wanna give a quick reminder to attendees. If you have questions, please feel free to put those in the Q&A uh, so that at the end, we can kind of get to your questions for the Emerging Leader Fellows. So thank you again for participating and don't forget to put your questions in there. Um, one of the things that you've all alluded to that I think may be worth kind of directly saying is that there have been a couple of things that happened in so 2020, we think about the pandemic, but there was also a great deal of attention on racial justice and systemic and structural racism in all of the systems that we work in, right? And I think, Leah, you were kind of alluding to that. What are the assumptions we make and to what degree are those based on race and what we think is a norm? Um, and so I think that it's important to, to kind of think about how that affects the way that we address the work that we do. Uh, and Kaylee, I was wondering if you could comment a little bit on, on that. How do we actually make sure that, and you, you alluded to the fact that this isn't necessarily happening in the population that you serve, but how do we make sure that when we have a resource, we've identified a resource that we're actually equitably distributing it? I think a lot of it goes back to voice. I don't know how many times we can say it, but just making sure that <laughs> the right people are at the table and also being intentional when we're really starting to work and looking at histor historical inequities in the things that you were trying to implement and how you can do the opposite of that, you know? So making sure that you're going into the community, talking to people, having lived experience at the table and really leading and guiding the work is what's important. And also realizing that um, checking your own biases, they exist everywhere and being open to learning and being called out. And I think that's important that you need to be open to change within yourself and within the work that you do and be comfortable with like, you might not always get it right. And someone needs to tell you when that happens. And that's something that you need to take seriously and into consideration in the work that you do. Um, I think, and I work in the maternal and child health field, and I think the inequities racially within that field have been highlighted over the last few years, really just within maternal health disparities as well as infant health disparities with black women and babies dying more than white women and babies. And taking that into consideration when we're thinking about access to mental health care, access to services and who's providing those is really important as well. Um, I think you just keeping it at the forefront of your work and like always race and equity affects everything um, and taking that um, perspective and thinking about who your services or supports are reaching and if they're not reaching the right populations being intentional and targeting those individuals and those groups to make sure that they're aware of and there aren't any barriers to them accessing those services or care. Thank you. 
Carissa, could you comment on how um, kinship care is affected by like baseline inequitable services and structures? Yeah, so I, I think that we can't talk about child welfare without acknowledging um, the systemic racism. So there's, I think there's been this heightened awareness um, throughout the past year and a half about the systemic racism. And I think child welfare, we can demonstrably show the effects of that. So if you've been in any child welfare conversations, um, then it's no news to you that black and brown children are taken away from their parents disproportionately more than white children are. Um, and that systemic racism um, where a certain racial group is acted on more frequently than another. And so I think how that, that, how that intertwines with kinship care is when we're taking kids, especially kids of a certain population, um, away from their families more, the underlying message there is your family is not as valuable, not as val not as um, worthy of protection as other people's families. And so I think at a minimum, we need to, um, when we, when it's necessary to take kids away from their parents that we're keeping those children with their kin, within their circle of support, whether that's family, within their community. Um, and not only does that reduce trauma and increase stability, um, but it preserves the child's cultural identity, their, their relational cultural ties. Um, and again, sends this message, you, you, your cultural ties, your family are worthy of preservation. Um, now, I, I think that kinship, care is a, um, a great response to say, hey, we wanna do something um, intentional to kind of um, counteract this, um, the movement of the system to remove black and brown children from their families more. Um, I think that's a great intentional response, but I um, also think that our child welfare system is based on this fundamental idea that when, when there's a problem with families, when parents are struggling, that um, we threaten to take away their kids from them if they if they don't step it up. Um, and I think that's deeply and fundamentally problematic, um, especially when most of our child welfare cases are um, neglect. And so they're related to poverty, truancy, homelessness, housing instability. And so we have this history of our, our society. Um, and I think Ruth, you already, already mentioned this, this history of disenfranchising, disadvantaging um, people of color. And then when they are struggling in, in the structure that we've created, we say, hey, we're going to take your kids away from you, get it together. Um, imagine getting your kids taken away from you and being asked to do something that's, you know, um, is a very just naturally coercive and, and manipulative way to get somebody to do what you want. So, um, so I think that the, we have to do this in light of um, do the work in light of the fact and with the knowledge, with the intention of saying, hey, and this is specifically affecting black and brown families and black and brown children. We're taking their kids away. We are further disadvantaging them, their children, the next generation and the, the, the current adult generation. Um, and so, so we have to think about ways that we can keep kids with their parents, um, keep parents with their kids. Um, and, and again, like go back to that supporting the natural community and family that is there. Um, um, and, and again, with, with, we have to have a change in perspective to say all families are valuable, all cultures are valuable, and um, how do we value them and say where are the strengths and how can, how can we, the serving systems, um, facilitate that um, instead of um, coming in with this idea of we're coming in to fix you because you're the problem. So I think it has to be this change in perspective. And I think child welfare is a, a wonderful example of where that's happening. Um, so I think we need to start with put, having kin, um, seeing them as more than just a placement resource, um, having kin be involved, um, having them be a support. Um, but also I think we need to take some serious looks at um, how our system is designed um, and whether that really does um, create equity or does it set us up to, um, to continue these inequities that we've continued to see and perpetuate. So I think I would call all of you change makers. And I think that a lot of the voices that you are all committed to elevating are the voices of people who are change makers and have potential to be change makers within their communities. And I'm curious what you think their greatest barriers are going to be post pandemic. So people who really wanna see changes, lasting changes in the various areas where you work, what are their barriers going to be as we emerge from this pandemic? Let's see, I'm going to start with you, Cameron. 
That's a tough question. I mean, I think, I think for me, when I've been reflecting about, you know, some of the topics in this panel and, and the question that you ask here about, you know, how to, the, the barriers that, you know, community change makers are going to face in a post pandemic world. I think a lot of what, I mean, these are words and ideas that have come up a lot in this conversation, but, but right now my head is really in this space of, of trust. I think as I was listening to Carissa, you share, you know, what you just shared about the child welfare and kinship programs and, and the issues of systemic racism and injustice. I find myself sort of reflecting on this idea that you know, we're, po we're, we're posing that community engagement and community inclusion and the elevation of youth voice and the voice of these change makers is a necessary tool in prevention. It's an impactful intervention for systems. But I think without naming issues like systemic racism, like white supremacy, like some of these, you know, really core issues that are, that are impacting the systems that we all work within, to just blindly have the expectation that we can set a table and engage communities and have communities join us in the change making progress our process is um, a bit of a blind idea because I think we really have a lot of, of harm and a lot of history to own before we do that. And so that's that's kind of where my my thoughts are right now is that in order, I think that's a barrier that, that community change makers are going to face that there's still a lot of work to be done by the systems and by the people in power who are, you know, setting these tables and trying to, you know, make impactful change that, that you know, we have a lot of work to do internally on our own um, before those, you know, moments of true community engagement and authentic relationship building can take place. I mentioned them earlier, but these ideas of adultism and professionalism, these, these lacks of understanding of you know, development and community strengths and these inequities and power imbalances, these are all real issues that prevent you know, true community engagement and authentic inclusion. And so I think that's a major barrier that, that change makers are gonna face in a post-pandemic world is, you know, and it's not one that's, that's new post-pandemic. I think it's just one that we have a different perspective on because of some of the things that have happened in the last year and a half whether it's the racial sort of inequities that we saw throughout the pandemic, whether it's the sort of housing justice movement that we saw here in Philadelphia. I mean, there's just, there, it was such a tense sort of political, it is such a tense political landscape. And I think for change makers, community change makers to really be a part of this process, it's gonna require a lot of work on behalf of systems to set you know, a table that's equitable and that's safe and that is affirming and that is inclusive of communities. And I, I wanna put the onus on us as, as you know systems rather than on on the communities themselves because i think as you know carissa and others have alluded to like they have the resources they have the power it's about us sort of breaking down the barriers that we put in place and i wonder if each of you could comment as you make it through this question um comment on starting with you cameron whether or not you think the pandemic had generally an adverse effect on trust and I imagine that's true for many of the systems in which you work, but I'm curious what you think the net effect of the pandemic was on that core value of trust. I'm generally pretty optimistic in my life, but I have a hard time saying that this pandemic has improved trust between systems and communities. I think, um, I think there have definitely been some innovations that have, you know, expanded access to care. I mean, I, from a from a healthcare perspective, we could definitely talk about how, you know, here as a health center, as a community based health center, you know, building telehealth programs has definitely expanded our ability to access people that may not have had access to our care who are, you know, farther away from Philadelphia, who may live in more rural areas that don't have the kind of care that we can offer at YHEP. But I think there, in a lot of this expanded access, there was a there was a loss of equity and a sacrifice in equity. I think, you know, we we lost connections to some of the most sort of marginalized and disenfranchised people. And so I think in that regard, the pandemic has you know put a real strain on trust between communities and systems. And I think that is you know one of the things that we have to address right now in this unique moment as we're sort of still grappling with the shifts in policy and in practice and also reflecting back on things that worked or didn't work or things that we want to keep in this post pandemic world or these new norms. I think we have to, you know, have community at the table, 
you know, assessing that with us. I think it's it's vitally important that we don't just make those decisions in a vacuum as we move forward in a post-pandemic world. That community is really leading us and telling us, you know, this is what worked for us, this isn't. Yeah, DJ, would you agree with that? Yeah, 100%. I, I would, I too would love to be as optimistic as my colleague. Um, but the, the reality is that there's, you know, when we're talking about communities that are facing the kind of issues that, that you know, the five of us deal with in our work, and we're contending with a very long history of, of, of distrust. It's not just last year. It's not just this moment with the uptick in gun violence. It's not just COVID. It's, it's not any one of these things. I think um, one thing that I've learned working with my young people in the Advocacy Institute around gun violence is that one, how they see the issue of gun violence does not exclusively focus on just, you know, shootings that happen in the community. They, 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 there's these other adjacent experiences that happen, the same places that have the most shootings also often sometimes are food deserts or often don't have, you know, um, adequate rec spaces that are safe and greening and all, like all of these other things. And so I can't come in a room and say, we're gonna talk about gun violence and not also engage in these other things that you're experiencing at the same time and letting, letting you tell me what that is. You know what, I'm, you know what I mean? And so um, I think, you know, in, in addition to kind of like the, the, you know, gun violence is racialized here in Philadelphia, it's not necessarily like if you zoom out and look at all gun violence, including suicide and domestic violence, it's not. But when we hear about gun violence, we very much so think about um, young black kids in Philly. And they feel it and they know it. And so engaging them in conversations where they already feel demonized to some degree, like, and, and, and you know, folks will disagree with me about this, but my young people really feel like when a violence, gun violence surges, young people are targeted and they're treated like a homogenous group, a monolith of like, of, of, of risk. Um, and, it, and it doesn't really give them room to feel safe to really engage in conversations of what navigating safety means. Hundreds of thousands of young people in Philadelphia and beyond navigate safety every day and never perpetrate gun violence, and never become victims of gun violence, but they're not talked about like that. They're not talked about in that way. And so giving, giving young people a space, even if you can, you're able to provide a space, it's not always safe to, to come in and say, um, what you want, what you feel, what you're experiencing, why you think certain things are important, why you think certain services are needed. Not every gun violence prevention service has to be focused on high-risk individuals. Sometimes young people just need a safe, a safe space to be and to talk and to, you know, just to, to feel whole um, and, to, and to be affirmed in, in their humanity <laughs> outside of, you know, being from a certain neighborhood that, that isn't, you know, it, it, there's, there's a number of things. And so I think one of the biggest challenges having seen a year of, you know, in the Advocacy Institute, we were able to continue um, our, our services virtually. We've been able to graduate young people through our program and engage them in issues of homelessness and, and gun violence and, and all of these things. Is keeping that same energy of how, how we adapted to reach young people and to keep them engaged, even though we, we all have Zoom fatigue. I'm sure we have Zoom fatigue right now on this call. Um, keeping that same energy, I think, you know, it, 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 I think I, I, I would be remiss not to mention that I think for impacted populations who have who, who remember what COVID was like, what, what it was like before COVID and then seeing how systems were able to adapt might be, I might be offended. Like all the kids got Chromebooks. There were kids who needed Chromebooks before COVID. There, you know, there, there were all these things that suddenly, you know, folks were able to do in the midst of an emergency that somehow it, it, we couldn't imagine that realm of possibility beforehand. And it's kind of a, it's kind of a weird thing to say, you could have did it, but you didn't. And now I'm supposed to trust you. And it's the same thing with young people that there's all these adjacent experiences that are happening. And we really do have to contend with that trust. And it's not just in our areas. It's, 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 a, it's a systems distrust. I don't think that people who um, we serve see, oh, that's, that's Cameron's thing. That's, that's YHEP, that's HPC. It's all, for many people, it's all the same. Just, you know, people serving institutions and sometimes in the history of the way that we've gone about things, it's just, we have to contend with those very long histories of distrust and really bring that to the forefront and be very transparent about it on the front end. Like, yeah, I know <laughs> that this is just another program. This is just another thing that you're experiencing and it, you might not see it differently or the differences between us and, and that's real. And we have to, you have to own that. Kaylee, I'm gonna ask you kind of a combination question. I'm also interested in how what barriers you, ex you expect change makers in your field to be encountering specifically around this issue of trust, which I think is a really important theme, but also given the fact that trust is challenging, 
how then do we make sure that they are at the table for the next steps? Yeah, I really love the conversation around trust because I think it's it's so important and crucial to increasing access, providing good services and changing systems. And I think that we're, many of the systems are working are working from a deficit with trust because we're digging ourselves out of a hole from historical mistreatment and poor experiences. Um, and you have to work to build trust. And I think it's about incentivizing systems and programs and policies to invest in trust building endeavors um, is really important because that without trust, you have nothing um, because people aren't going to want to engage with systems or programs without, if they're not in a trusting way. I've heard from many young people who have had bad prior experiences in the mental health system. And they're like, I don't want to go through that again. I'm not going to open two months later. I'm not going to go to this crisis center when I feel like I'm being treated poorly. So it's about really investing in systems and programs to rebuild trust when we're working with communities and populations who have been treated poorly in the past. Um, and I think a lot of that in thinking about moving forward and what we've seen during the pandemic is that people don't want to go back to the before times like Dijanae was saying, like they've seen and they've witnessed and experienced the, some of the benefits that have come from system changing during this time of crisis and really leveraging that um, and to sustain it, it's going to take collective movement and like holding the powers that be accountable. Um, and I think it's also about understanding and being able to describe the benefits and gains that we've made um, in a way that policymakers and um, will invest in and want to sustain and being able to craft a narrative that supports con continued investment and really thinking about ways to describe and articulate the importance of trust, the importance of centering equity, the importance of centering voice um, in what we've seen in the last year and moving forward to continue and sustain that. Awesome, and Leah, same question to you. So how, how do we anticipate the barriers that change makers will encounter? How do we build trust and bring them to the table? Absolutely, you know, I think that for, um, for many of the pandemic related changes um, that occurred uh, during the past year for the juvenile probation system, one of the greatest challenges is going to be ensuring that those changes at the time were necessary for probation to continue in this unprecedented time become integrated into normal operations moving forward. And certainly the utility of those changes is not going to be known for some time just based upon um, data being collected on overall outcomes and that taking time. And this may make some policy and decision makers wary of continuing those changes. Um, and I really do hope though that some of those changes um, are worth considering. Um, and I think this might actually get at not only your question, Ruth, but I did see a, a question um, in the Q&A from Anne Marie around um, examples of technological innovations. And I think some of these examples that I'll share with you all um, may help further strengthen trust between youth and families and the juvenile probation systems. Um, just as an aside, Ruth, to answer your other question more specifically around building trust, um, I think in the midst of the pandemic, um, the impact of trust between youth and families in the system may have been dependent upon where you lived and how the juvenile probation department in your jurisdiction responded to you. Um, you know, not all juvenile probation departments have the luxury of access to certain resources um, to ensure uh, remote delivery of services, to provide a more flexible, adaptive work setting for uh, probation officers, or have um, community-based positive youth opportunities that they could have delivered to youth and families in alternative ways during the pandemic. And I do want to recognize that, um, but I do think that it's worth our policy and decision makers um, within the juvenile probation system to continue to consider how we can use virtual communication, um, such as phone and remote check-ins with youth on probation to allow for easier and even more frequent contact between youth and probation officers. You know, there still needs to be, as, as we kind of all talk about these technological innovations within our systems, there still needs to be an appropriate balance between remote and in-person interactions. In-person communication, it's still needed. It's still valuable to both youth 
um, and the systems serving them. Um, but we can make modifications um, to help youth and families overcome barriers that have historically made it difficult for them to engage with their systems, which I think my colleagues have articulated very well so far. Um, I also think particularly for juvenile probation, we need to keep the focus on youth who are most in need of support and services. Um, keeping kids on probation who are succeeding, but not yet at the end of their probation terms, um, may not make a whole lot of sense in terms of how we're allocating resources and staff attention, um, and maybe doing more harm than good in the long run. Um, and I think also, again, going back to thinking about the workforce, right? Um, as Kately just mentioned, and I loved the comment that we have to incentivize these systems to want to change. And I think part of not only including the community and its members, that being youth and families in probation at the table, we also need to think about the probation officers and how can we allow for more flexibility um, in, in how they do what they do. Um, and how can we create um, more flexible remote workspaces that could potentially provide cost saving benefits and even time savings for both um, probation officers and the young people they serve. And this all may lead to creating a more engaged climate for youth and families. Um, so I think as we move forward with hopefully continuing the changes, um, you know, specific in juvenile probation from the pandemic, that we not only need to think about um, who needs to be present at the table, but how they need to be involved. Um, this is certainly something that my colleagues and I who work on the GR TAM program are constantly thinking about, um, that it's not just leadership at the state um, saying, as you know, I think Chris had kept mentioning, like we're coming in to fix a problem or coming in to fix juvenile probation. No, this is a collaboration. This is a partnership. And part of that partnership is not just inviting certain people, but it's thoughtfully considering and discussing um, with not just your stakeholders, but your community, how everyone can best be involved to create and sustain that change. Um, so that's what I think is going to drive reform forward, at least in the juvenile probation system, because that's the world that I work in. But I think certainly for many of the other systems that my colleagues on the panel um, are operating on a daily basis. I'm going to put this question to the whole group for anyone who, who has thoughts on this. Um, one of the things that we haven't talked about you mentioned incentivizing for the programs, incentivizing and, and kind of valuing the expertise of community members such that we give them formal roles and compensation for their knowledge and for their wisdom. And we demonstrate in practical, tangible ways that we're valuing their participation equally to that of people who are credentialed, credentialed or people who are officials from the state or federal government or whatever the other you know, source of expertise might be. So I wonder if anyone has any comments on that need. You said something really quick. Um, I think it's absolutely necessary to um, pay people for their time and for their expertise and for their participation in things. Um, I think that that was the case for me prior to COVID, but definitely, in the middle of you know a global pandemic and you know the way that employment was working at the time and just all the things that were going on and just knowing what I know about you know violence prevention kind of initiatives being very um, job readiness based um, that I think you can't ask people to I, you cannot ask people to come and share their experiences their lived experiences which are often quite negative in, in some of the systems that we work in uh, very you know based in trauma there's a there's a lot that they share and asking the person to give a piece of themselves to you that seemingly is for your benefit sometimes especially when it comes to like research and program evaluation and things like that how we acquire grant money and having to show impact we have to we, we, we ask to know those things and to have someone bear themselves um to folks they don't know who like Kaylee said aren't always there consistently you might have a different case for every few months is a lot it is a lot um, and, and, and folks should be compensated for that, both because of you know, what that might do to someone and also just because they're experts. We pay folks who come in and speak all the time. People will fly people in and put them up in hotels to speak about you know, their experiences in the work that they do. And we don't necessarily keep that same energy with folks who have really, who have lived experiences to share that with us. And I, I think that, 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 that you know, not doing that sometimes, um, you know, you're, you're in, in a roundabout way lending someone to how much or how much you don't value what they have to say, I think. 
and whether that, that's the, that's the intention, that might be the impact, right? And we don't want to do that, and, we, and and that also erodes trust. And so I think that in, incentivizing people and paying people for their time is absolutely necessary. Um, and it, it's empowering. It's empowering for for someone to be able to tell their story and be like, well, we're gonna you're gonna be compensated for that. To say that this is important. And and I think if you if systems were to do that more often, you might have folks who feel like they're not being exploited when they walk into our spaces. No one wants to feel like they're being exploited. And I think, you know, paying people for their time is definitely a way to do that, a small way to do that. I think in, in the child welfare world, um, it looks like recognizing that people are experts on their own family. And so, so creating a space where you're bringing the family together to, um, to, problem solve and support. And I think there have been efforts to do this, but I think we need to do it better. We need to have better facilitators to, to look at the family as experts in their own supports. But I think this kind of goes back to some of the things that have been brought up is we have to look at what the cost is. So to the, to the people who step up to get involved. So, so many people I work with they choose not to get involved with child welfare because they're afraid of the risk to their own family and their own children in their care. Um, and, and so we're doing harm. We're doing, we are not um, creating a space that is safe. We're not creating trust. Um, and I think that we need to look at what we ask from people when we're offering them resources. And, and sorry, this does go back to a little bit of our previous conversation of this trust, but, um, Oftentimes when I'm working with kinship caregivers, the conversation I have with them is, um, can you do it on your own or are the resources available to you if you become a licensed foster parent, a licensed kinship parent through the child welfare system? Um, are those resources worth the risk of being involved with the system that is going to hold this threat of taking the children away from you over your head? Um, and it's not just parents who, who live under this umbrella of the, of the threat. It's it's can also because if if um, the agency doesn't feel like they're stepping up, jumping through the hoops that they're supposed to, then they can take the kids very easily away from kin. So um, I think that that in order to build this trust, we need to look at what what we're asking from people when they step up and are part of the table. What are the risks that they're taking to engage in the conversation and put themselves out there and to be um, to be an expert, to, to share their experience. And so that's how I've seen it played out in the child welfare. I'm sure some, some of um, my other fellows can uh, talk a little bit about maybe some risks that they've seen um, for people to get involved. Because I think that's such an important calculation. When we're asking people to step in, up and participate, we have to recognize that sometimes there's a cost or a risk. Um, so yeah, paying them is great, but also like thinking about um, not only how can we make it a benefit to them, but also what are we asking them to um, to put at risk? Thank you so much. I'm going to invite Mark back to the conversation so we can get to some of the comments that are in the chat. Um, but I also did want to, while we do that, invite any additional comment from either Cameron or Kaylee on that on that topic. I was just going to mention that, you know, to your point, Carissa, about the, the risk calculation, I think a lot of the ways that, you know, my project and we at YHEP are thinking about, you know, inclusion, you know, we think about it in a lot of different ways, whether it's youth peer support positions or youth action boards, youth speaker series, focus yeah. groups. I mean, there are tons of different ways to involve community in the system, <clears throat> but I think a lot of them come with the promise of systems change. And for me, when I think about the risk, I think the, the greatest risk to, you know, the young people that I work with is to, to bear their stories or to, you know, put forth this labor under the illusion that something is going to change because of it. And I think you have to have a space built that is safe, but is that's also willing to listen and to change. And I think that so many times we invite community and young people into spaces to share their stories or to provide us with feedback or advice. And then we, you know, we compensate them for it. We may compensate them greatly for it, but at the end of the day, you know, if nothing changed, then you know, you know, there the risk was not worth the reward, not not nearly. Um, so I think for me that that risk is really about how amenable the system is to change based on that that inclusion of community voice. And how often do we use, you know, this is the token story, you know, a sob story to just confirm how we've already chosen to do things. And so I think that's such a great point, Cameron, of we have to be willing, 
not just willing to, to listen and have people talk, um, but be willing to make changes um, that might be really painful or just difficult because we're working, we're talking about systems, but this goes back to the beginning of our conversation that we've seen through the pandemic. The system can change. We can adapt. We can, um, we can respond to unexpected things. And so um, I think that's where there's a little bit of hope, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. I like ending on, on that note for that section. That's wonderful. Yeah. So there's definitely hope for change. Uh, and Mark, I wonder if there are any questions that we want to lift up from the, from the Q and A. Thank you, Ruth. Um, I think that's a perfect tee up to one of our first questions, which comes from Kelly Davenport. Um, Kelly writes, I am the network founder and CEO of Friar Schools. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, I'd love to hear from the panel their thoughts about the power structure itself. Without eroding and evolving the power structure, change is more fraught and less likely to occur. So my question is, what assumptions do you have about the power structure around how to produce positive social change and dismantle systemic racism. Well, Kelly, I, I'll, I'll start, I'll kick it off while everybody else can think about your answers. Um, but I think that's such a great question. Um, and I think that, um, that there are a number of ways there are people who are talking about how do we shift the power from the system to the community. Um, one of the amazing uh, models that I've seen is the, um, the uh, participatory defense model. And um, I know some people are looking at how, do, how would that look in child welfare? But basically it's where you bring in um, the family of the defendant, um, the, the community and people around the defendant um, and, and say, how do, we, how do we support this person in, um, and, in finding evidence? In, so anyway, um, look up participatory defense because it's a great model and there are people who can talk about it way better than I can. Um, but I think also there's some really great literature and just conversation around um, what does abolition look like in the child welfare world? Um, so look up um, uh, Dorothy Roberts. She's she's done some great work and continues to have these great conversations on the movement for family power, but talking about kind of what I alluded to for, before. And again, there are people who are much more articulate and knowledgeable about this than I am. So I encourage you to go look them up. Um, that uh, the, the fundamental problem is that we have these systems that are created um, on our history. I would think we have to be, uh, be acknowledge our history and honor history of disadvantaging um, the our black communities who came over as slaves. So that's where we started. And, and there continue to be these trickles that we see um, that are still founded in our systems today. And so, so what does it look like to completely dismantle that system and still say, yes, but there are still children who are abused. Um, we need a response to that, but, but is transformation of that system just going to continue this problematic um, foundation that we have, or do we need to completely get rid of it and say, and let's start over, not, well, yeah, start over in, in saying, how do we start from this um, idea of community power, of, of community strength, um, and build a system from there instead of um, a system that has already created, here's the power um, that's separate from the community, how do we um, shift that power to the community? So those are some resources I would say to go to look into um, that have some great literature and thoughts around that. I can also just jump in and quickly say that at least in terms of shifting culture and shifting power within probation, I think a key element here is finding and elevating your champions of change within the system. Um, so finding the players in the system who are, are already advocating for and practicing a different uh, practicing reform or practicing change um, with the communities that they serve. Um, because those are going to be your agents of change. Those are going to be the individuals who probably have the best knowledge of um, including the community, partnering and collaborating with the community. And just as a quick example, you know, I haven't talked too much about it this morning, but in terms of the GRTAM program, um, we are able to identify really champions of graduated response and juvenile probation throughout Pennsylvania. And these are 
frontline probation officers um, who have both oper both worked in kind of the old system of probation and have been actively involved in developing and implementing a new system of probation within their departments. They're doing so with fidelity, they're doing so with enthusiasm, and they are very um, respectful and aware and inclusive of youth and families in that process of change. And we're really looking to them um, to be the experts for us in helping us to move this change forward. So I guess, you know, for anyone else beyond probation, um, certainly looking for your champions of change and um, thinking of ways to elevate them and what they do. I think I'll add, we've had conversations amongst ourselves other times about our role in systems that have caused harm and working with them or alongside of them and is abolition of burning it all down and starting over what needs to happen or are there ways to create meaningful change within these monoliths that have existed for centuries um, and our role within those and I think it's a hard question to answer in that we have to be imaginative and envision a better society a better world that is equitable um, and that starts from starts all things from the bottom up um, and really looks to the community for answers. But I think it's a, that's a huge question. I don't have to have the answers, but I think we've all grappled with it in our own work about what that looks like for us and like personally how we grapple with those different conversations. So it's a fantastic question that I don't have a good answer for, but. Yeah, that is a really huge question, but I think that I'm always gonna, I don't know if this will wear off of age, but like I, I really do believe in the power of young people. I think um, I've become a jaded adult. I try my best not to be a jaded adult, but I think, you know, when you, when you come of age and in a time where like you, you might not trust systems or you've seen the harm that systems do to people, to families and communities, um, you kind of become indifferent. I know a lot of folks who I've, you know, spoken to about gun violence over the last year, and there are people who are really passionate about it, but have no faith in what leadership is prepared to do about it. So some circumstances are just, it is what it is. This is what it is because, no one's going to do anything about it or you know we, we begin to some people begin to have this attitude that this is just what it's going to be and there's nothing i can do about it most young people i talk to that's how they feel um i asked a, a group of young people in southwest and Bartram gardens how um pick a problem that you care about and i had about a third of my class say i don't care about anything and the more we unpacked it because i was you know try to provoke yeah you care about something what do you care about everything was too big everything was too big and too bad and too scary and too unamenable. Like we, we, there's nothing that we can do about the things that I care about. And so I am disengaged, I don't care. I don't care about anything. And that's a dangerous place to be in. And I think if we can um, do that very intentional work to re-engage people to get, this is why we should care. The more that we can get more and more people to care whether they're young, whether they're old, as long as it's together, systems can't contend with all of us. It, it's just because there's such a small group of us who are really like, getting fatigued in this advocacy and this activism we really do need those partnerships in the community we really do need that buy-in and that trust and the more we channel our energy into that i think the more kind of you know power and numbers we have to go to systems and say this is actually not working for any of all the hundreds and thousands of us as opposed to like the same group of activists who are doing this work and have the energy to do it so i, I do think that that power lies in the community and the more that we do that the more successful we'll be wonderful um, next question comes from Asia, who asks, um, and I believe this is for, for you, Dijanae, I think you mentioned it at the beginning. Um, can you please remind us again of the name of the book that you mentioned earlier? Oh, it's called Pedagogy of the Oppressed, and it's by Paolo Freire. Freire, I think. I don't know if I'm saying that right. I think that's also the name of the school system that she just mentioned, but um, I'll type it in the chat right now. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Leah mentioned a little bit earlier, this question comes from Anne-Marie. I'll just give everyone else a chance to respond. Um, Anne-Marie writes, a number of you have referenced the acceleration of technological innovation during the pandemic and the ways in which that has expanded access for the populations you work with. Can you share a few examples? Also, are there examples of how technology has exacerbated inequities? What can we do about that moving forward? Well, I go ahead, Leah. I was just going to say, I think I mentioned it earlier, but just in terms of, um, you know, probation uh, departments being able, those who are able to transfer from uh, traditional in-person approach to a more remote based one, 
Um, certainly having um, virtual check-ins with youth and families, whether that's through Zoom or over the phone. I'm actually aware of one county in um, uh, Pennsylvania who um, in the summer and late fall, this isn't technological, technologically innovative, but very resourceful, particularly for youth and families who do not have access to technology that will allow for remote-based check-ins. Um, one uh, department had a, a bike patrol um, in summer and early fall in which the probation officers would actually meet youth um, um, outside their homes and do a bicycle check-in. They'd go for a ride around the block. Um, so certainly those are just some quick examples of how um, probation was thinking creatively and flexibly. But again, um, depending on where you lived and also the status of the, the socioeconomic status of the family, that is not a luxury for all families. And so, um, and even for probation departments for their staff, not every single probation department is equipped to provide its staff with um, a cell phone and with a laptop. Um, so certainly um, the pandemic um, exercise probation's uh, brain muscles in terms of how it could do its job, um, not through traditional approaches, but it also exposed the inequalities and inequities in technology access. Um, and certainly, you know, I have yet to hear, but um, I applaud if it exists, any probation departments who did find a way to provide greater access to youth and families so that those remote or virtual check-ins could continue to occur. Um, because they also certainly helped in reducing failure to appear in court for youth when hearings went virtual as well. So just a few examples. And yeah, I think I had kind of mentioned in the beginning how um, in, so, in a lot of ways, I think virtual, um, moving to virtual made things easier. But I think I, um, as Amory kind of asked about, you know, how have, how has this exact exacerbated some of the inequities? Um, I see that especially in, you know, working with kinship caregivers, many are grandparents. And so some of those are older grandparents um, who, who struggle to, um, to bridge the technological gap. Um, and so they struggle when there aren't in-person options, when there isn't a, an option to do things on paper. And so um, I would love to see that move as we move forward. Um, how can we use both technology to facilitate, but also still make it accessible to those who might not be so technologically savvy? Um, I think another area that um, I saw technology uh, being not a positive thing was um, visitation for, for parents and family members with kids. Um, that that when visits were restricted to, to virtual, it's really hard to have a meaningful visit with a one-year-old over the phone. And so, yes, can, can children bond and, and get some positive from hearing their, their loved one's voice? Yes. Um, but it is also a huge disadvantage for, for kids who weren't able to see their parents. Um, I also remember talking with um, a parent or caregiver who said, well, why can the foster parent take the child to see all of their family members, but they can't bring the child to come see me? And so there were definitely some, um, some inequities that we saw um, throughout the pandemic. Um, so while, while it Technology facilitated visitation, facilitated hearings, facilitated filings, um, it also we can't completely move to a, a technology dependent world because some of that in-person stuff is so important for certain people, but also for facilitating certain relationships. Yeah, I, I wanted to add into, I mean, these have all been really great points. And I think for us, you know, YHEP has a long history of serving young people, vulnerable young people, and working pretty closely with, with young people who are experiencing housing insecurity and homelessness. And we are also an organization that what seemed like overnight went from entirely in-person services to entirely virtual and telehealth-based services. And I think one of the things that re really, you know, that it drove home for us was that housing is healthcare. I mean, I think when I, when I look at the, my screen and I see you know, all of my colleagues, I see us sitting in private rooms, in quiet rooms, we have privacy, and we have access to technology and the internet. And these are all privileges that many of the young people that we work with do not have. And we're asking them to share with us, you know, incredibly vulnerable things about about their health. And I think that is definitely an area where, you know, yes, technology expanded access to us. It sort of grew our appendages into more rural and suburban areas around Philadelphia that may have been inaccessible due to transportation to our health center. 
But at the same time, um, we definitely lost a connection to many young people who didn't have the space and the privilege to have you know, a conversation with us over, over a piece of technology. And I think that for us was definitely um, something that we struggled with and, and that this, this experience really sort of highlighted was that housing is healthcare as much as anything else. <clears throat> Quickly echo everything Camera and Carissa have said. Um, I think also working in a healthcare space, it has many of the same issues with telehealth that it's not, not always having a safe space or access to internet. Um, but then on the other hand, it does eliminate a lot of barriers that young parents face in accessing mental health care. So whether that's childcare, transportation, clinic hours, school, um, that those barriers were decreased in certain ways, um, but then also losing those social connections, missing milestone events, um, that come with having a child um, and being able to connect with other new parents was, was often lost or lost in translation in the virtual space in many different ways. Um, but yeah, I know we're short on time, so I'll keep it short. Ruth, do we have time for maybe one more question or how, how do we look on timing? Uh, I think we can do one more question and then we can transition. Okay. Um, I will try to keep this one simple, but you know, no uh, good answer is ever simple. So this question comes from um, Dominique Michaels, a former Stony Foundation Emerging Leader Fellow. Um, it's a current doctoral student at UCLA. Um, of course, first she says thank you to all the amazing Emerging Leader presenters today. Um, and her question is, I wonder how shifting power to communities has been a part of your work and what barriers you have experienced to ensuring true power is held by communities within your organization and outside of it? A tough one to be sure. Uh, well, I'll, I'll talk since uh, <laughs> nobody else is jumping in. But so I think in working with kinship caregivers, um, in the legal world um, is looking at what legal rights they have and their legal rights are limited. Um, so I think that um, looking to put power, I, I think this is a hard question to answer because I think that we have this system that has set up that doesn't give families power. Um, and so kind of how we look at whether in the foster care context, um, we look at if, if we're going to put a child with kin, we look at if they qualify under the licensing standards used for general foster parents. And so things often disqualify kin. Um, that could be a criminal history, a prior child welfare involvement. And so I think that um, we can very easily and on paper disqualify kin and say, you know, you're cut out. And the problem with that is then we completely cut that person off from having any involvement with the child at all um, because they don't qualify um, as as uh, to be a licensed foster parent. And so I think we need to think about how do we say, um, validate their role in the child's life, even if they are disqualified for certain reasons. But I also think we need to shift from looking for ways to disqualify kin who we, we might want to disqualify um, foster parents um, who just want to have no relation to the child. But I think when it comes to working with people who have a relationship with the child, um, we need to look for ways to include them and work for ways to um, and have that be kind of the mindset instead of the mindset of, um, are they disqualified for any of these reasons? So um, that shift in perspective, I think, um, to put power back with um, community members. But I think that's hard to, I don't see that happening very often um, as much as I would like. So I think that's hard to do, but I think that's one of the ways we should do that. A great example, Carissa. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and I did want to make sure we left the last few moments for uh, Ronnie Bloom um, to give some closing comments for us. She'll be joining us in just a moment. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Ruth. Uh, my name is Ronnie Bloom, and I'm the executive director of the Stonely Foundation. Uh, I'd like to begin uh, by thanking Dr. Abaya for her excellent facilitation today. We are incredibly proud to include her encounter as one of our Stonely Fellows. Dr. Abaya's work as a pediatric emergency physician and a public health researcher has put her at the cutting edge of gun violence prevention efforts in the city. 
She was recently selected as one of our as one of the five 2020 integrity icons by the Philadelphia Citizen. I'd also like to thank our incredible Emerging Leader Fellows, uh, Dijanae, Cameron, Kaylee, Carissa, and Leah. Wow, all I can say is wow. Um, we are so proud of your work. I personally learned so much from you today, so I'm just absolutely thrilled to, to have the opportunity to, to sit in on this and hear all of you. So thank you for sharing your perspectives, your insights, and your expertise with us this morning, and more importantly, for all of the transformative work that you've undertaken over the last year in, I think, what we all acknowledge were particularly challenging circumstances. As we look forward uh, to the recovery phase of the pandemic, the Stonely Foundation is committed to working with our fellows and our partners to reform and reimagine our systems of care by centering racial equity, and as you've all heard today, the voices of young people. We encourage you to uh, check out more about the Stonely Foundation, uh, our Stonely uh, Fellow Program and our Emerging Leader Fellowship Program by visiting our website at stonelyfoundation.org. And we also invite you to join us for future, for future virtual convenings, which we'll continue to hold over the summer and into the fall. Um, finally, thanks so much to all of you for joining us today. Bye-bye.